Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the freedom that we enjoy in this country. We are thankful for what heaven is doing to rescue sinners from themselves and from the plans of the devil. And we pray that as we study this morning, as we read, as we meditate on your word, that you will convict us again of our responsibility to make thorough preparation to be used efficiently by you. Bless us now with your spirit. Let him come as our sacred teacher, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hmm. There is a many different signs that Jesus is about to come soon. One of those signs is the turmoil and unrest that is in the world. The Bible says, you've read it many times in Isaiah 57, it says that the wicked are as the what? as the troubled sea when it cannot rest. In Lift Him Up on page 127, it says, this is an, what does it say there in red? Read that for me. An age of unrest. And the youth drink deeply of its spirit. The, the young people today and adults are drinking in this discontent, this Restlessness that says, never before has there been so many important interests at stake. Never were such momentous issues before any generation as await the ones that now coming on the stage of action. Never were the youth of any age or country so earnestly observed by the angels of God as the youth today. And then it goes on to say that in all of this turmoil and unrest, that heaven is l watching something, it's looking for something. It says, all heaven is watching with intense interest for every indication of the what? Word. Of the characters that they are forming. God, heaven is looking, in, and it's not just young people. He's looking at us to see what kind of characters are we forming in this age that, is, that has so much unrest as has never been seen before. You know, this was written many, many years ago, over a hundred years ago, but its words are, no, are more full, more true today than before. Do you know that in Sudan, what continent is that on? Africa. That there was a street protest that went on in Sudan for months. Those protests got so great that it toppled the dictator that had been reigning there for 30 years. In what country? I don't know if you know or not that France has been having what's called the Yellow Vest protest movement. Have you, are you, are you, how many of you have heard of that? I know you guys don't watch the news much, but since one year ago, there's been tens of thousands of people in the streets of France, wearing, because in France you're required, everyone that drives a car has to have a yellow vest in their car so that if they have an accident, before you get out of your car, you have to put on this yellow vest. It's required in France. And, and the middle class people in France started a, a they, it's called a leaderless movement where they're saying, we're being overtaxed so much. The elites in this country are controlling everything and they've been rioting for a year's time. In Ecuador, what, con what, what, what continent is France on? What continent is Ecuador on? In South America. Do you know that, have you, that there's been massive protests in Ecuador recently? Are you aware of that? In Ecuador, there's been thousands of people in the streets because the president of Ecuador said, we're no longer going to give you fuel subsidies for your petrol, you're going to have to pay top dollar. And the people said, no, we're not. 
You rich people are taking everything and you're going to try to all of a sudden raise our cost of living? Thousands of people in the street. In Haiti, where's that? In the Caribbean. You know that there's been protests in Haiti? Well, I'm glad that I'm giving you Sabbath school class this morning. <laughs> because inspiration says that the spirit of unrest is spreading throughout the world. In Haiti right now, for over a year, the country has become ungovernable, ungovernable, because thousands and thousands of people are protesting and looting and burning up businesses, blocking streets, because the corrupt government received hundreds of millions of dollars from Venezuela to build infrastructure, and that money was all stolen. The people are saying, where is the petro Caribe money? In Hong Kong, what continent is that on? It's on an island. But what continent is that considered to be part of? It's in, it's in every continent. Have you heard about the Hong Kong protests? I know you've heard about that. If, you've, if you look at any news at all, there are hundreds of thousands of people in Hong Kong right now. Right now. And the, the people in Hong Kong, they are, they're from every class, from the wealthy, from the unemployed, from, from, from the middle class workers. They're in the streets and they are demanding that five demands be met. It's all started when the Chinese government said that we will extradite anyone from Hong Kong that does something against Chinese laws. And Hong Kong has a separate set of laws. And these people said, this is, this is Beijing's first efforts to roll back the freedoms that we have there. And, and in Hong Kong right now, they have gone in and they have shut down the international airport. Where tens of thousands of people just flood into the airport where you can't even move in there. It's just, and this spirit of unrest is spreading. In Iraq. Why are they all wearing masks? That's what I thought. Oh, in Hong Kong, because, um, that's it. <laughs> well, the, the purpose of wearing a mask is so that you cannot be identified by the powers that be. And you know, China doesn't play. And a matter of fact, in Hong Kong, they just passed a law saying that no protesters can wear masks for that because they're, they're photographing these people. They're trying to get their identity. But this spirit of unrest is in Iraq also. In Iraq, there's been thousands of people in the street because the prices of things have gone up. And I'm just showing you just a little bit of current events just to let you know that there's many signs that are letting us know that Jesus is about to come. Something is happening in this world that lets us know that the sands and the hourglass of time are running down. How are these things all, uh, are they calling each other and, 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 and coordinating it? This is just something that's happening in the, in the, in the spirit of man and his nature where people are saying, we are discontent with what's happening where we live, and we won't take it anymore. They all have the same leaders. Yes, so that spirit of unrest is from the enemy. And the question is, can that happen in this country? Do you believe that the spirit of unrest can rise in America and, and that and that the conventions of the way that things are done can suddenly be brought to a standstill. Do you think that can happen? It, it can happen. It can happen. And the question is, uh, and I will say this, and when it does happen, the difference is Americans are armed. This is the most um, armed country in the world. There's 300 million firearms in America. So when the spirit of unrest comes to our country and it becomes violent, it's going to become much more lethal and much more dangerous. And the authorities are aware of that, and that's why there's massive movement to disarm the citizenry. And, 
Not like America. In England, there's no, there's no guns. In Australia, there's no guns. In many of the European countries, there's no guns. In the African countries, you cannot have guns. And um, in, England, in England, if you, go, if you go on the internet, you'll find that their murders are all knife crimes. And they have epidemic knife crime murders in the United Kingdom right now. But they don't have guns. The, some of the police officers in England don't have guns. But, but let's come back to our subject at hand. So this unrest that's in the world is a sign that Jesus is coming and that the Spirit of God, it says in 19, page 11, is being withdrawn from the earth. The question is, it can come in America. Why hasn't it come in America? Why hasn't it come in America? There's a reason. And that's because this Christian nation has a responsibility and God is restraining for now that spirit of unrest, but it will surely come. We read it in the spirit of prophecy. What's keep, so what is keeping this spirit of unrest from exploding? In Revelation chapter, what chapter is this? Where the four angels are holding the four ones. What chapter is it? Anybody know? Revelation chapter 7. It says, and after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having what? The seal of the living God. That means a God that's alive. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, the wind was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have what? Sealed who? Now, you know, that little phrase there in pink will make a wonderful little Bible study to go in the Bible and see what does the Bible say a servant is. Because the only people that are going to get the seal, they're described here as the servants of God. That word servant in the Greek, it means a slave. And a slave is someone that doesn't do their own will. They do the will of the master. What the master says, that's what they do. And the Bible actually has about four or five wonderful little texts on what it means to be a servant. And those are the people, that's what we should study, because so, if we want to get the seal, we need to know what it means to be a servant. And it says in verse 4, And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So the, the unrest that we are seeing in the world, even the unrest in Hong Kong and Haiti and France, it's being restrained right now by these angels, and it's being restrained. Heaven is holding it back until something is accomplished. And what it, heaven is very much interested in seeing that it's accomplished is that God's sons and daughters are sealed. Now, what does it mean to be sealed? Here it is. 4 BC, you read it 100 times, page 1161. It says there, just one paragraph says, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but uh, read it in words in red for me, please. It says what? But a what? Settling into the truth, both what? And so that they what? So it says that the sealing is a settling into the truth. The Bible is the truth. And it says in two ways. To settle into truth intellectually means you've studied it. You've studied it and someone comes and they say, oh, no, that's not true. They'll say, uh, there's only two members of the Godhead. And you say, well, the Bible says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. But no, there's, it comes with this theory, and you just tell them, I'm standing on 1 John 5, 7. There are three that bear record in heaven, and these three are one. And, they, and, and you are on that text, and you're standing on that text, and everything they come, you cannot be moved from that text. It's talking about, to be settled intellectually means that you actually have taken out your Bible and you've studied some things out and you see it clearly in your mind. Today, brothers and sisters, 
brother and sisters. There are people that they get all of their spiritual truth off of YouTube. They, they, they put on a, uh, uh, their television and somebody else does the study for them and they just sit and they listen. Or, or there's people that they're on these prayer calls every morning, five o'clock in the morning. Instead of having devotional time in their own Bible, praying with God, talking to God, they're on these prayer calls. And, and so when you're depending on somebody else to lead you in prayer and somebody else to do your Bible study for, you're not going to become settled intellectually, you're not going to know the message because you won't have that videotape to play when someone asks you the question about that doctrine. You won't be able to go get your DVD player. We need to have it in our own minds, amen? And that means you have to study. But how do you become settled spiritually? You, and you, you accept it you practice it, you live it. It becomes part of you. And it has to become such a part where you cannot be moved. So that you're, you're talking kindly one day, but when that little person that you don't care that much, or that little child, I shouldn't say a little person, but when, when, when a child talks to you rudely, you get sharp. Your spiritual experience, it changes. Because some of us, we can take a lot of abuse from adults, but a bad child just rubs us the wrong way. Or some of us, we can take a lot of abuse from a child, but a, but a, 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 a man that talks to you rude, it touches the nerve. And, but we've got to become so settled in what we're living and practicing spiritually so that whatever the temptation comes, we will not be moving. That's what it means to be sealed. And this little church right here is planning some evangelism. Is that correct? Yeah. You guys are getting ready, ladies are getting ready to do some evangelism. And so I tried to create or to, uh, to bring a message that will help make preparation for this work of evangelism. And the title of our two studies this morning are A Revival of primitive godliness. Now, is this a need? Do we really need to have that? Do we need that? In the book Christian Service, page 41, it says, a revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and, what does it say there? Most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. So it says a revival of true godliness. That means the godliness that it it's, has sound integrity. It's not shaky. It's not sometimey. It's consistent and it's in full blossom. Uh, one page later in the Christian service on page 42, we have the quote that we've read many times where we are defining the terms of our, our, our title. The title of our message is a revival of primitive godliness. It says the revival and reformation must take place under the ministration of who? Spirit has to be the one directing it and, and creating it. It says revival and reformation are two different things. Revival signifies what? A quickening or a bringing to life of the powers of the mind and heart. It means a resurrection from spiritual death. So revival means that you're born again, you have a new spirit, God's in your, in your heart and life, self is dead, and you've been resurrected with a new mind and new heart that the spirit puts within you. It says reformation signifies a what? Read that for me. A change in what? Habits and? So reformation means you actually straighten out the things in your life that aren't right. It says, Reformation will not bring forth the good fruit of righteousness unless it is connected with the revival of the Spirit. You've got to be born again in order to change your habits. Revival and Reformation are to do their appointed work, and in doing this work, they must what? Blend. They must blend. So in order to have evangelism and to be able to really fill up this room with people, we here need to have 
a resurrection from spiritual death, a, a renewal of spiritual life, and a reorganization of ideas, theories, and habits. The title of our message is The Revival of Primitive Godliness, and that comes from a great controversy chapter uh, where it talks about the last final movements where God makes an effort to warn and, and successfully warns the whole world of his coming and what needs to be done just before he comes. And it talks about how the churches of today have just gone way down the path of apostasy, but it says, notwithstanding, in spite of the widespread declension of faith and piety, there are true followers of Christ in these churches. It's talking about the Sunday churches and the Adventist churches. Before the final visitation of God's judgment upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a what? A revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since when? Apostolic times. And then it says two things will be poured out upon his children. It says the spirit and power of God will be poured. So that when you talk to people, God's spirit will convict them your words will be as arrows. It won't be just bouncing off their head. When you speak, God's spirit and power will come through those words and there will be results. So in Great Controversy 464, it says that there is coming a revival of primitive godliness. Now, what is godliness? To make it as simple as we can, here's a statement in book education. It says, higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's ideal for his children. Godliness, and then it's defined. What's the next word? Godlikeness God is the goal to be reached. So when we take those two state, those three statements, we put them all together in a dictionary quote, we can define the title of our message this morning. A revival means a renewal of spiritual life. A reformation means a change in what? Habits and practices. If you go to the dictionary, the word primitive means the first or earliest of its kind. So when God says a revival of primitive godliness, he's talking about the godliness that Jesus and the disciples manifested from the very beginning of the Christian church. And that word primitive means that it's from the, it's the original, that's another way to say it, from the beginning. And what does godliness mean? So what is needed is a spiritual renewal and the type of godliness that we saw when Jesus and the disciples walked the earth. And it's coming. And when it comes, it's going to shake this world. And that's how evangelism can best be done. It's when the people who are actually sharing have had a change of experience and they're living and walking in a new life, then as they go out to talk, God's spirit and power comes, and the results are. Our first part of our, our Sabbath school hour, I'd like to talk a little bit about the last part of our title, and that is what godliness actually looks like when we see it, because this is just gonna be just review for you Bible scholars, because um, I think that our characters are a little bit bent and deficient, and that as we go back and look again at the example of Jesus, it kind of shows us, hey, this is what we need to get in line and improve, and I think there's areas where we all can improve on. So let's talk a little bit about the attributes of God's character and just kind of reflect and uh, share a little bit, perhaps, if you'd like to, on um, how you can improve or what you're convicted you should do. The predominant trait of heaven, its divinity, is love. The Bible sets forth love as the very substance of his being. The Bible says, he that loveth not knoweth not God. Why? For God is love. And this love is that God has for us it's not dependent on how we act. Do you realize that? That when you act up or act out, that that doesn't diminish his love? 
In fact, he, loves, he loved the world when it was in total rebellion against him. It says in Romans 5, 7, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And his tender care for rebellious Israel beautifully revealed his patience, compassion, and willingness to forgive. So much so that God said, in all their afflictions, what does it say? He was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of old. That's deep. You know, these people that were rebellious and stuff, and it says, and all of the things that happened to them, he said he just took that as, him, as if it was happening to himself. And so for us to be as loving as God is, that means that our love to other people will not be affected by their behavior. You know, when people do well, we love them. And when they act up, it's like our love is like, it's like we've drawn a little bit, you know, except for family members. But if we have the love of God in us, really, it will manifest to everyone that's all around us. You just start... When you really have the love that God has, it just continually flows out to those that are, you're around. Sons and Daughters of God 101 says, Christ's love is deep and earnest, flowing like an irrepressible stream to all who will accept it. It says there is no what? No selfishness in his love. And it goes on to say that it's not only to those that we hold a a sacred relationship with our family members, but this love flows out to how many? All, All with whom we come in contact. Well, what, how does it manifest? It says this love will bestow little acts of what? To make what? People say, well, I want it to go this way. And you just say, that's okay. We'll, we'll let it go that way. Are you flexible, brothers and sisters? Or are you rigid? If you have love, you will be flexible. flexible. You know, in the sanctuary, there are seven trees. And in the holy and most holy place, the walls of those golden rooms were carved palm trees. And one of the reasons is that the palm tree, the way it's designed with its fibers in concentric circles, it is flexible. It's the only tree in a hurricane that survives. All other trees are broken or uprooted, but the palm tree has extensive roots that go out 100 feet. It's rooted in such a way it cannot be uprooted by a hurricane. And when the wind comes, what does it do? It bends. And when the wind stops blowing, it snaps up straight again. When the wind blows, it bends. When it starts blowing, it snaps. That, that's how we have to be. The problem with us, with our love, is that we become rigid where it has to be. I remember I used to work at a church, and there was a man, that, an older gentleman, that cleaned the church, a white-haired gentleman. And he cleaned the church. He vacuumed the whole church, cleaned all the bathrooms. And I asked him one day, hey, my brother's name was also John. I said, do you mind if I come help you clean the church? He said, come on. And when I went down to help him clean the church, everything I did, it was wrong. I put a chair here. That chair doesn't go there. That chair goes here, one inch over. I would go to get the, the comet. He said, don't use comet. Use the other Ajax that has bleach in it. And everything that we went, finally, after I, I tried for an hour to work with him, I said, John, you're not letting me help at all. He was just micromanaging me. He had no flexibility. And he was like, well, if you don't want to do it the way that it needs to be done, you shouldn't even be here. And I'm just like, I just want to come and help clean the church. And a lot of times in God's house and in our own houses, we have that rigidity. And we are not speaking tender, encouraging, sympathizing words. We're not performing. We're not making, what's that big word with the C there? Concessions. We've got to have that flexibility. It says it will lead us to sympathize with those. If you see an accident on the road out here, will you stop to see if the help is needed or will you keep driving? Don't answer. Well, so what am I talking about? You know, to have the love of God, it, you have to be willing to be inconvenienced. How many of you are always on a schedule, you're in a rush, you got things to do? You got things to do. 
if you have things to do, you have to be careful because God sometimes will change your schedule. In the Bible, there's a story about how Jesus was going to heal a man's son. And on the way, someone came and had a daughter that was sick. And Jesus stopped and healed that daughter. He was going to raise a child that had died, but he stopped and healed that daughter and had conversation and then continued. He was willing to be interrupted. Are you able to show love to someone who has views that are different from yours? You know who that is? That's Dylan Roof that killed all those people in South Carolina. And uh, they found a picture of him later on. He's arrested now. And they found this picture of him with a Confederate flag and a gun and all this thing. And the question is, if this person who has done some terrible, if you bumped into him and you knew who it was, would you be willing and able to minister to him? Because Jesus was able to minister to everybody. So if we want to be, have the character of God and have that character of love, we need to make concessions, speak kind and tender words, and that love needs to flow out to whoever is in need. What else can we say about God's character? The Bible says that God is, what does it say at the top? Generous. He's generous. And you can see, catch a glimpse, a vision of his infinite generosity if you meditate on Calvary. Do you know that what was shed on Calvary was infinitely above what it was worth? The life of God that was shed, the blood that was shed, was a tremendous amount greater in value than what he was, he paid a price much higher than what he was redeeming was worth. Does that make sense to you? It's kind of like seen in the story of the um, alabaster box. Remember that story? Where um, an alabaster box was broken and uh, the... Uh, the ointment that was poured out to anoint Jesus for his burial was worth a year's earnings back in Bible's day. And somebody protested against that. He said that th this could have been sold and given to the poor. He wasn't thinking about the poor. He said if you would put that in the treasury, <laughs> he could have put that in his pocket. But, but that story was, was trying to speak to our dim minds that what Jesus poured out on Calvary was much more than is necessary to redeem little us on this earth. And it shows God's this tremendous generosity. He said, I'm willing to pay whatever is necessary. And if we're Christians, if we have his character, we will not be stingy, tight, and holding on. We will be generous and giving as God was. Um, God is generous and his followers are also to be generous. The true Christian will be generous with his love, his affection. He'll be generous with his kind words, his money, and his what? His time. Ooh, those are some valuable things. Valuable things to be generous with. The generous child of God will give the sick person the what? On the serving platter won't save the best for themselves. The Bible says that if they sue you at law to take away your coat, that you should do what? Give them your cloak also. If they compel for you to walk a mile with them, that you should go how many? You should be willing to, to, to give. And sometimes we try to hold back, and actually if you give, not only it will be a blessing to them if you give generously, it'll actually be a blessing to you. You believe that? The Bible says in Proverbs 19, 17, that those that, that give to the poor, it says they loan it to the Lord, and it says that he will repay. So if you, you try to take care of people that are worse off than you, you don't lose at all by that. So you we need to come out with our, not only our, our means, but with our time, our affection, and our words. Proverbs 11.25 says, The liberal soul shall be made what? How many of you want to be made fat? <laughs> I, I know I will get you with that question. And it says, And he that watereth shall be what? 
watered also himself. Proverbs 11.25. The problem is, if, what is the problem? I, I, I love this picture so much. You've seen it in about five of my slide program. This is what we do. We have things and we're just like, well, you know, the Lord blessed me with this. The Lord gave this to you. You know, do you know that, this is going to sound shocking to you, do you know that the devil can bless? Do you believe that? That the devil can bless his followers. That the devil can prosper people to keep them from going in the right way. Oh, boy, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you a story, but I was going to tell you a story. But you know, the devil, you have to be careful of what you have and thinking that everything that you have was how it's supposed to be. You know, God sometimes gives us things to give to other people. He gave it to you as a steward to give to someone else. It wasn't for you to, to amass and to grow. I, I went to visit a, a church member, and um, when it was time for me to leave, click, click, my truck wouldn't start. And I was like, oh, man, I must, my, my, um, alternator must not be charging my battery my battery's dead we tried to jump it and it was just my battery was very very weak so i buy all my batteries at walmart for this reason because walmarts are everywhere so i went in with my walmart battery to the local walmart which was near where my friend was in indianapolis and it was a walmart that was poorly managed and poorly run it was a dirty Walmart. Some Walmarts are, are not actually clean. And I went in there, and there was a gentleman behind the counter, and I told him my plight, and he was, um, he was like, well, when did you get this battery? And I said, oh, I don't know. I probably had it for several years, maybe six, seven years. I'm sure that there's no, you know, I don't know what the, if there's any, I'll get, I know I get a core charge, but I don't know if it's, in that period of time where I'm going to get a rebate on it. And he said, well, let me see. And he was in the computer, and he was talking, and he went to talk to somebody, and I was standing there a long time. And then he finally came back, and he said, he said, your battery is free. I said, really? He said, yeah. Here, just give me that one, and I'll just give you the replacement for it right there. I was like, really? Oh, man, praise God. And so he said, I, I'll even carry it to the car for you. And so we were walking out of Walmart, and I was like, I couldn't believe it. I don't know if you know it or not, truck batteries are expensive. It's like, a, it's, oh, it's way over $100 for that battery. And when he took it out of the car, I gave, him, I gave him $5. I said, thanks, man, I appreciate it. And then when I got in the vehicle, when my friend was driving, it's like it, and we were driving back to get, put it in my truck, I began to realize, I was like, that guy probably put some stuff in the computer that wasn't true. And so I ended up getting a free battery when I shouldn't have, when I probably shouldn't have got one. I was like, he's probably doing this all day long. He's probably walking people to their cars and getting tips for carrying a battery that belongs to someone. I said, I got blessed by the devil. You know, I'm thinking that it was, when I first was driving off, I was thinking that it was God that blessed me. But as a day or two passed, I began, I said, you know what? This is not, this is not the blessing that I thought it was. I said all that to say that sometimes God, things come to us and it's from God for the purpose of blessing other people. And sometimes things come to us, it's not even, it's not even God that's bringing. That's a, that's a, that's a thought to have. But we're selfish not only with our means, but we are selfish with our time. We're selfish with our time. A lot of God's people do not want to be inconvenienced. And if you as a church want to do evangelism, you've got to start saying, I've got to make time for people that have legitimate needs. There are people that will want to waste your time. I was just talking with a sister about that before. There are people that will call you and ask you to help them do something that is well within their power to do. There's some people that they'll just try to use up everybody else's time. And you shouldn't stop what you're doing to help people to do something that they can do. But there's legitimate people that need help and we need to make time for them. If a book is more important than just a few minutes with your son, that's a problem. That boy 
health needs are important and perhaps more important than getting those next two or three paragraphs read in the next few minutes. We need to be generous with our funds and it's often that we spend a lot of money at the department store. We'll just drop $50, $100 like it's nothing. But when we get to church, if we open our purse and we pull out a 50, we look for the 20. Or we pull out a 20, we look for the 5. It's like, it's like the value of money changes depending on where we are. If it's at, the, at, the, at the store buying shoes, $100 is nothing. But the offering plate is like, that's too big. And so we've got to just, if we want to be generous, we should be generous in all aspects, in all areas, because that's how God was. God was patient and long-suffering, and we are to be what? We are to be patient. It is the nature of the carnal heart to be patient with our what? And impatient with the what? Faults of others. But when we're truly converted, this disposition will be reversed. We will become impatient with our own shortcomings and long-suffering with the defects of others. There's many, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, you got your Bibles? In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, it talks about the godly minister. And just real quickly, I just want to show you, it says something very interesting here. It says, it gives a long catalog of their traits. Verse 4, 2 Corinthians 6, in all things approving ourselves, as the ministers of God. And then it lists the whole catalog of things, but only one of them has the word much in front of it. And that's the very first one. It says, in all things approving themselves as the ministers of God, in what? In much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in prisons, tumults, labors, and watchings, and fastings, and it goes on. There's only one word that says that, that the two ministers that are approved, that they have much of one trait, and that trait is patience. It's the only trait mentioned in the three angels' message. The only character trait mentioned is here is the patience of the saints. And we've talked about this before. That Greek word means, read it for me there. So that word, Greek word for patience not only means that you get through it, but you get through it with a smile that they're just, and you're just saying, praise the Lord. Thank you for that. Thank you for those sharp words. God's going to bless you. It doesn't affect you. You have an upbeat attitude while you complete the task. So you not only complete the task, but you complete it with a positive attitude. What happens with many of us, we start out our day, and we're very positive, and things start going wrong in our day. And by the time you get to the mid-afternoon, you're singing the song of murmur. You're complaining. How many of you are complainers? Raise your hand now. Oh, well, not too many. Hmm, I got both my hands up. I complain, so I have to constantly focus on praising God instead of complaining. To be patient and long-suffering with others, God will teach you that day by day. It's the trait that we'll need to, be, to go through the, the crisis of the last days, the hardships and trials of sleeping out in the snow and in the mosquitoes and not having food. In order for us to be praising God in the midst of that, we'll need to have much patience. And that is developed day by day as God brings trials into your experiences. If you go knocking on doors here, trying to hand out your, your literature here, you're going to get some rude people. And for you to be cheerful and unaffected by that, God has to renew that every day. And, you know, you have parents that, you have the mother that will say, oh, you children, don't be going into the refrigerator at night. When you go to bed, I don't want you to go. And she'll go into bed and she's asleep. And no, you know, the children will sneak out and they will disobey what the mother says. And the, that mother who was herself supposed to be on a special diet is not following that diet herself, but her attitude towards her children, her, her um, very uh, forward harshness dealing with them kind of um, shows that she doesn't have the character that she really needs. We have to learn to be patient with the faults of others 
and impatient with our own long sufferings. What other trait of character do we need to have if we're going to be, have that godliness, that godlikeness? We need to be truthful in all things. Jesus, of course, was called the way, the truth, and the light. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And so we need to be absolutely truthful in our words. And we, as Christians, often tell white lies. We exaggerate. We stretch things. We say things that are not totally true. I'm starving. You're not really starving. What you should say is I'm very hungry because starving is something that takes place after not eating for days. And we need to have accuracy in speech. You need to have what? Accuracy in speech. The true Christian will always be truthful, avoiding every shadow of dishonesty or exaggeration. What happens is that sometimes if you talk too much, you'll say something that's just not absolutely accurate. And so a lot of us will be helped by just talking less. Amen? Just not talking as much. You might do much better off. And in Book Patriarchs and Prophets, it says, it's the intention to deceive as what constitutes falsehood. By a glance of the eye, a motion of the hand, an expression of the countenance, a falsehood may be told as effectively, effectually as by words. All intentional, what does it say there? Overstatement. Overstatement. Every hint or insinuation calculated to convey an erroneous or exaggerated impression. Even the statement of facts in such a manner to, as to mislead is a falsehood. And so we should be careful that our speech is accurate, and we should be careful that when things need to be said that are unpleasant but true, that they be said. What did I say? When things need to be said, that may be unpleasant, but they're true. Those things should be said. Prophets and Kings, page 141, says that we should not seek to avoid the unpleasant results of plain speaking. We should not seek to avoid the unpleasant results of what? Sometimes, we, sometimes a sister has to take another sister aside knowing it's going to be sparks and heat. You know it's going to spark up, but you need to take that sister aside and say, my sister, I, I need to give you a little medicine. Will you be willing to take it? Let's have a word of prayer, okay? And the Bible says that when you're giving medicine, that you need to mix it with a little sugar, okay? It says in Ephesians 4.15, but speaking the truth how? You should speak the truth with a meek and humble and loving spirit, not with a harsh spirit, but it says speaking the truth in love, it says this is how we may grow up into Christ in all things. Do you know that that's how Jesus was? That he spoke the truth, but he was very, very tactful. When they brought the woman that was caught in adultery, and, and they said, oh, the law of Moses requires that she's, that she's be dealt with right now. What did Jesus do and say? And then? And what did he do while, when, he, when he was saying that? And what was he writing? And, 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 as the, and he could have actually spoken that out loud but he didn't. He, in a very tactful way, he started, and they came over and they, and they looked at that, and, and, and then he said, he that is without sin. And, and, and what were they thinking? They said, if we try to act as if we're without sin, he might even put uh, some names to what he put down here. We better just go away and just leave it alone. So Jesus was able to give medicine, but he gave it in, in a way, in the best way to try to win and to rescue and redeem. And that's how we should be when we speak the truth to others. So I'll give you the test for you. 
Let's just say, this is a hypothetical situation, that a wife prepares a green drink for her husband, and the green drink is bitter and nasty, and she says, how does the green drink taste? I made it with love. What should he say? Okay, somebody else. Did you try this yourself? <laughs> okay. What else could she what else could he he say? Thank you, but I want something. <laughs> okay. I mean, some situations you have to give it a little bit of thought. Because he can't lie. What did it say there? It is what? So that's the truth of the matter. So, but you have to be careful how that is communicated. Go ahead. Everything you don't have to answer. That's correct. Um, my wife has fixed something for me, and she'll say, Do you like it? And I'll say, Well, I really like your enchiladas <laughs> a lot better. You know, I, 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 I try not to, if she just spent a lot of time preparing it, I don't want to just, hmm, you know, just come down on that. And so we, when we're speaking truth, and we should speak truth, we should be careful how it's said. Let's move on. Yes, there's, there's ways to do it. But if people come to you and they say, and you're having a bad day, and they come in and they say, how are you feeling? You should not say, I'm fine. You hear what I said? If you're not having a good day, and someone comes and says, how are you feeling today, sister? I'll feel better when the day's over. Yeah, you, you, what, but what we say is we just say, oh, I'm fine. And that's not true. We need to be accurate in our speech. We should say, ah, pray for me. You don't have to go, go into a lot of detail. You can say, oh, pray for me today. Or you can just, you can, there's lots of different ways, but we should not look people in the eye and tell them something that's not true. We need, and I know that I've done it a lot of times. We all do it if we're not careful. And God wants, there's a statement in Desire of Ages that says that Jesus' speech was as pure as the sparkling stream. His speech was always pure. And that takes prayer and concentration. God is punctual. When the fullness of time was come, God sent his son into the world. Desire of Ages says, like the stars in the vast circle of their appointed path, God's purpose knows no haste or Delay. Well, it's it might make you feel better, but is it true? You could almost say, I felt better than that. <laughs> "Yes," and I'm I'm hoping to feel fine by this afternoon. I mean. There's different ways to, 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 to try to focus on the positive without saying something that's not true in the moment. Say God is helping me through the day. Yes, there's, there's, a, I'm counting on him to help me through the day. there's a hundred different ways. And my, my whole point is to, is to cause us to think about um, the accuracy of our speech. That's my whole point. My point is that we want to be accurate. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. It's just, it's just grace that most people yeah. That you you've thrown in a modifier that actually qualifies what you said. But if you were to just say, if you're get, if you're really having a bad day, and you're not feeling fine, what well, I didn't say that you did. I mean, just many different ways to answer that. Pray for me. You could just say, pray for me today, or whatever. You don't. You don't, even have to, you don't have to even say how bad you feel. But I'm just saying, what you say should be true. Would you agree with that? What you actually say to that question should be true. When my, my, my mother, I remember as a child, would ask my father, she put on her dress, she'd say, dear, how do I look today? And my father would say, do you want me to tell you something nice or do you want me to tell you the truth? He would actually tell my mother that. I heard him say it many times. She would say, I want you to tell me the truth, of course. And he'll say, well, I don't think that that dress suits you well. 
why not try the black and white dress? He, he would ask her, what do you want me to, to tell you? I can tell you something nice. And, um, and that's how we should be. We should be cognizant of the feelings of others, but also sterling true to God as much as possible. Okay, let's move on. I want to wrap this up. Our time is, is up. It's, we're coming down to the end of our talk this morning. We, God is requiring us to have primitive godliness. That means that we need to be godlike, and that means understanding what this character is, and God was always punctual. And it said, in Desire of Ages, it says, like the stars in the vast circuit of their path, God's purposes know, what does it say there? And you know that the planets are going around the sun and they come around to their complete orbit on the exact millisecond. They are not a millisecond ahead or behind. That's perfect in its timing. They're not losing any speed. They're not speeding up at all. And they are always right on time. And that's how God's servants, his children, need to be Christians will also be punctual in their appointments and on time with their activities. This will require, what does it say there? Planning and what? Some people are not business-like when it comes to time and have no problem doing, what does it say there in yellow? Stealing minutes, Stealing minutes from other people. The Christian must learn to stay on task and on track. They should buy a good watch and refer to it regularly. We, sometimes we steal other people's times. We make them wait on us. Instead of being ready, they have to wait. And you're actually stealing time from somebody else. And the Bible says, thou shalt not, what? You should not steal. So if you tell someone that you're going to be ready at 9 o'clock, you need to be ready at 9 o'clock. You need to be ready before. You need to be ready at 9 o'clock. <laughs> That's right. Because something might come up. <laughs> That's right. So, and, and, and emergencies do happen. Things come up where it prevents us from being on time, but you should do all in your power to be on time. The last one is God is holy. Over and over in the scriptures, it says, God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. And God's followers are also to be Holy. There, in Isaiah chapter 6, it talks about a angels, seraphim, that cry continuously, holy, holy, holy. That, that, that's a deep thought to meditate on, that of all the things that the angels could say about God, that would be true. They could be saying loving, loving, loving. They could be saying compassionate, compassionate, but they could be saying that, and it's true. That's not what they're saying. They're saying what? Holy. And when we, and when we really understand the, the sanctity and the holiness of God, we'll recognize what we have to become, because the Bible says that, um, that ev even as the Father in heaven is holy, so we should be holy. That says in First Peter. I'll look at that in just a moment. The Bible says that the angels actually do what? When they speak his name, they cover their face before they even speak his name. And, it show, and, and we have lost the great sanctity, the difference between that which is common and that which is sanctified. It's lost in the church. The, the church doesn't recognize it. When we're at a place and someone will say, we're going to pray, people are still talking. You should stop talking immediately. If someone says we're going to pray, you should just stop talking and bow your head. When they say that, let's kneel, or, what, or they say, or they'll have their Bible. I've seen people take their Bibles and they just throw them on the floor underneath the chair in front of them. You should never set your Bible on the floor. You wouldn't set your food on the floor that you were about to eat. So why would you set your spiritual food? We, should, we shouldn't put stacking stuff on top of the Bible. But, but, uh, but be, be, when we start to really recognize how holy God is, we'll give him the first minutes of our day and the last minute of our time, we'll devote that to him. And the Bible says that his followers are to be holy. Here it is, 1 Peter 1, 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so what? 
and all matter of conversation, that word means conduct. Leviticus 11.44, For I am the Lord your God, ye shall therefore sanctify yourselves, and ye shall be holy, for I am holy. I'm just, I want to say this before we close, and I'm sorry we went a little bit longer this morning. It says, During his or her devotional time, the Christian is to receive God's presence in his mind and life through the gift of the Holy Spirit. When Christ is received by faith, the Christian carries what? With him everywhere he goes. And then the home, the office, the church, your car, your job, the Walmart line, every place becomes fragrant with a heavenly atmosphere if God's presence is with you. Did you catch what I said in there? Being holy, what happens is that when you ask, what makes something holy? It's only the presence of God. You know, when Moses was on the mount, he said, take off your feet. Why? Take off your, not your feet, take off your shoes, off of your feet. Why? And what made that ground holy? It was because Jesus was there in the bush. He said, well, oh, 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 don't walk up on me with dirt. And it's God's presence. And so it's in our devotional time that we ask God to come into our lives through his spirit to come and to dwell within. And then wherever we go in the day, we're carrying this wonderful atmosphere. I have a whole study on this. We don't have time right now. It's one statement. But the book Medical Ministry, page 252, says the faces of men and women who talk with God to whom the invisible world is a reality, express the peace of God. They carry with them, read those words in yellow for me, please, the soft and genial, what? Of heaven. It says they care, genial means friendly. They, they carry with them a soft, friendly atmosphere of heaven. What's the, what's the atmosphere? Tell me, somebody tell me what the atmosphere is. What is that? What is the atmosphere? It's, it's, it's kind of hard to even to describe it. It's like, like an aura or it's like you're carrying like a presence. And it says that those people that talk with God, that they, that they carry with them the soft, friendly atmosphere of heaven and diffuse it in deeds of kindness and works of love. Don't have time to read all of this. But it says that if all could see and understand and be doers of the words of God, what peace would happen is, what health of body and peace of soul would be the result, a warm, kindly, what does it say here? Atmosphere of love that cannot be, cannot be, you actually carry something in a room. When people get around you, people will say, I like it when she comes around. Because when you come around, you bring something with you, and what you're bringing is God's presence. And, and, and when this church starts going out and doing evangelism in this community, the question is, what kind of atmosphere are you bringing to the door? You actually have to bring to that door God's presence. You have to bring it, and it's expressed in warm, kind, loving, tender words and expressions that people say, I'm glad that you showed up. Even if they don't even accept anything you have, They'll say, that was a nice person. Because people, they can read you. Children, they can read you immediately, just within the very few first seconds, before you've even started to speak, they've already made a judgment on you. So we have to fix our face, amen? Everybody smile. We need to fix our face and bring that atmosphere of heaven. My life today says, under the influence of three traits, what does it say? Kindness and gentleness and atmosphere is created that will heal and not destroy. We should come to people with meekness, kindness, and gentleness. Even if they're talking crazy, even if they're talking harsh, we should have a smile and bring that meekness, kindness, and gentleness. Just closing the word picture and steps to Christ. There's a wonderful word picture of Jesus that says that he went about doing good.
it says love, it's going to be the words in yellow, love, mercy, and compassion were revealed in every act of his life. His heart went out, and what does it say there in yellow? Tender sympathy. It says, read these words here, it says, Jesus did not what? One word of truth, but he uttered it always in love. So we got to speak the truth to each other, but in a kind way. He exercised the greatest tact and thoughtful, kind attention in his intercourse with the people. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. His life was one of self-denial and care for others. It says, while he bore himself with divine dignity, he bowed to the tenderest regard of every member of the family, of the family of God. In all men, he saw fallen souls whom it was his mission to save. Such is the character of Christ as revealed in his life. This is the character of God. In those two pages, Steps of Christ, page 11 and 12, it's, it's a page and a half. It actually describes his character. And if you read that every day, it will just show you, ah, I don't do this right here. I don't do that right there. I need to step up so that I can carry that atmosphere with me. We're living in a world, sisters, where there is so much unrest, conflict, and tension that uh, people are searching. They've lost their peace. They don't know where to turn. That trouble, that unrest is coming here to Ohio. It's coming here. There's going to be people that are out of their mind here in Ohio. God right now is restraining that manifestation of conflict and unrest. He's restraining it while he's waiting for his people to become settled intellectually and spiritually so that they cannot be moved. And the question is, will this little group make that preparation for the outreach that needs to be done in this dark part of Ohio? How many of you want to strive even harder to have that character. we got some areas to work on. That's, desire. That's your desire. Kneel with me as we close out in prayer. Father in heaven, we see that true godliness is the greatest and most urgent of our needs. We see that you said in inspiration that there's going to be a revival of the primitive, the original godliness that Christ and the disciples manifest, manifested in the first generation. Lord, we want to have that character. We want to be able to carry with us your atmosphere. When we meet people on the street, we want our witnessing to not just be a, a track that's filled with truth and scripture, but a track that's in the hand of someone that has that meekness, love, and joy. Bless us, Lord, to be softened down and made into your image. Fill our hearts with that, that unselfishness, that generosity, that love, that punctuality, all of those traits that reveal who and what you are. And make us a sanctified vessel in your hands to do a work wherever we live. Because we've asked it in Jesus' name.